No, we are live. Oh, sorry. Okay, welcome back everybody to the afternoon session of the last day of the Citizen Science Conference. Um, we have a um, 45 minute uh, session uh, with you and apologies for the sound in the background. We have 45 minute session with three talks um, uh, by Ashish Jha, Unikrishnan MP and Vijay Barve, uh, each of which will be 15 minutes, well, 10 minutes plus, uh, plus questions. Um, and please stay on after this session because we'll have a concluding session, just a brief 10 to 15 minute session at the end, uh, just to thank a few people, but also for some announcements of the way forward. Okay, so please don't go away after the after this session. All right, so we start with a talk by Ashish Jha. Ashish is a research associate at the Kerala Agricultural University. He's involved with the Kerala Bird Atlas, which is a statewide citizen science project where he performs data analysis and scientific uh, writing and, and uh, publication. So uh, she should be talking about the Kerala Bird Atlas 2015-2020 uh, aspects and outcomes. Uh, we'll play. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Ashish Jha. I'm working as a research associate at Kerala Agricultural University. Since January of this year, I have been working on this project called Kerala Bird Atlas. And today I'll be talking about the key features of Kerala Bird Atlas and what we have been able to achieve so far. So what exactly is a bird atlas? So the first bird atlases were prepared for United Kingdoms and Northern Ireland, wherein a distribution of 30 common species was displayed onto a gridded map. Uh, the first bird atlas in India was uh, tried for Delhi and Haryana by Harvey et al. But uh, I have put a question mark if you can notice here. This is because uh, unlike the traditional methods, they already had their uh, survey data. They already had their checklists and later on they mapped it onto uh, the gridded uh, map of Delhi and Haryana. So the first systematic bird atlas was prepared for Mysore city. The work got over in 2016. And it was different from the Atlas of Delhi and Haryana in a way that they first laid out the grids uh, onto the map of Mysore city and volunteers went in all those uh, you know, city uh, cells and they surveyed and collected the bird data and which was later published as an atlas. The first bird atlas, the state-wise bird atlas was prepared for the state of Kerala. Uh, this is the largest bird atlas in terms of the area coverage, uh, number of volunteers, as well as species coverage, largest bird atlas for the entire Asia, in fact. So what allowed Kerala, what made it possible for Kerala to have its first, to have first bird atlas in India? So we should look into the history of bird monitoring in Kerala. So this book uh, called Keratan Pakshigad, uh, published in 1958, Birds of Kerala by K.K. Neil Kanton, is most likely the first book in India in vernacular language. And it has inspired generations of bird watchers in Kerala to take up bird watching as a hobby. Not just that much, Kerala is probably the only state where every single bird species found within the uh, state has a Malayalam name, which makes it very easy for people to identify or and to associate with the bird and to take interest in identification. Uh, several citizen science uh, activities such as you know, Pongal bird count or Bihu bird count and so and so has started very recently in India, but citizen science driven surveys and activities have been happening in Kerala in the protected areas of Western Ghat since 1990s. So it was a very routine activity for people to go out and, you know, for volunteers to do uh, bird surveys and census. So all this allowed uh, Kerala to have it, to have first bird atlas of India, state-wise bird atlas, because of the large number of volunteers that they have. So all the 14 districts of Kerala, which you see here, uh, were divided into grids. So this is the grid I'm talking about, uh, basically six by six uh, cell. Each of this, uh, so this is around 40 square kilometers. So the entire Kerala was divided into these cells of 40, 40, 40, 40 square kilometer. And four subcells of like almost 880 such 40 square kilometer cells covering the entire Kerala. And more than 400 volunteers contributed for six years to compile almost 3 lakh records covered. The black regions are the areas that could not be covered for a specific se season. 
the only region which was not covered in either of the season was this rani division of pathanamitta district because of the inaccessibility of the region so here we see how the number of checklists were uh, submitted year wise day wise and uh, the day time wise so peep and they met at kerala agricultural university in 2015 and they decided to have a state wise bird atlas they made this whole plan and blueprint and they right away started with the wet season that, uh, from august onwards from august to october they started with the bird census so this is the 16 onwards they have carried out for both wet and dry season 2018 they could not cover the wet season service the entire work from planning to execution everything was done by volunteers so this is evident why uh, this shows why uh, we have maximum number of checklists being submitted for the weekends because these people would go out to their routine jobs during weekdays and would take out time to uh, add their data or to do surveys for uh, kerala bird atlas during the weekends in the third graph we have two data being displayed simultaneously first is the number of checklists submitted at a specific time like from 6 am to 6 pm which was our survey timing so it shows that maximum checklists were sub, uh, submitted between uh, 7 to 9 and yes that's a that's a perfect timing for uh, bird watching and few checklists were also submitted during the birds reported per checklist so we have that uh, it was almost 20 that is highest for the list sub am and uh, it was again higher in the dry season that is january february and march as compared to the wet season uh, that is august september and october uh, this is because in january uh, during the dry season you also have migratory species so for the final analysis we analyzed a uh, one species so you might be wondering why like initially i said that we had 61 because we excluded the nocturnal and the pelagic species uh, the kerala bird atlas protocol were designed for surveying uh, the nate uh, the diurnal uh, land birds so we excluded uh, nocturnal species so the data shows that white cheek barbet and house crow they had all the species that uh, 361 species into different categories based on their abundance in kerala see here so it shows that 94 species they are very very rare because they contributed less than point like close to 0.1% to the entire kbu data set versus any species uh, which ecosystem wherein you have uh, the rare species are more numerous that is uh, uh, like 10 species would be very rare versus one or two species would be most abundant in a, a avian assemblage so this is a very normal pattern so here we see that these dark uh, blue cells are the air the cells which had max, uh, had the so for the final analysis we analyzed a uh, 361 species so you might be wondering why like initially i said that we had 380 species reported so 361 because we excluded the nocturnal and the pelagic species uh, the kerala bird atlas protocol were designed for surveying uh, the nate uh, the diurnal uh, land birds so we excluded uh, nocturnal species and pelagic birds so the data shows that white cheek barbet and house crow they are the most abundant species in kerala uh, 13000 this close to 14000 record shows that out of 25000 checklists 14000 of those checklists had white cheek barbet records so i divided all the species that uh, 361 species into different categories based on their abundance in kerala very rare rare common and so and so which you can see here so it shows that 94 species they are very very rare because they contributed less than point like close to 0.1% to the entire kbu data set versus 10 species uh, which like such as white cheek barbet uh, house crow black rump black rump flame back uh, rose ring parakeet all these species contributed almost 30% more than 30% to the entire 
uh, Kerala Bird Atlas data set. And this is a very general pattern in an unique ecosystem wherein you have uh, the rare species are more numerous. That is um, uh, like 10 species would be very rare versus one or two species would be most abundant in a uh, avian assemblage. So this is a very normal pattern. So here we see that these dark uh, blue cells are the uh, the cells which had max, uh, had the absolute coverage. That is, they were uh, covered completely. They were sampled completely. That is, thirty two checklists. But despite that thing, uh, we have areas which were not uh, which have less species count. For example, this region and this region. And this is evident that they also have uh, less number of families reported and overall diversity is low in these areas. Why? Uh, that is to be analyzed further, but I believe it could be because of the land use pattern in those regions. What about the distribution of conservation, species of conservation concern? So here I estimated that for a given cell, how many endemic species are there and I gave them a score. So here we find that endemic species, uh, the cells have high score uh, in the Western Ghats region. And yes, it makes sense. Uh, Western Ghats species are endemic. So, But when it comes to IUC and threatened uh, category species, we find that they are not just restricted to Western Ghats. They are also there in the West Coast. Now, it could be because of the species such as painted stoke and uh, black-headed ibises, which are globally threatened, but they are found in good numbers in India. And they are found in these kind of you know West Coast and uh, the paddy field area. So that's why we have IUCN threatened species in the West Coast as well. SOIB, that is State of India's Bird Concern category, uh, high, medium, and low, uh, that also matches quite well with the endemic species score and shows uh, that the Western Heart species uh, have high SOIB score, the Western Heart areas. Now, the Kerala Bird Atlas. Uh, was, as I said, conducted for all the 14 districts and almost all the districts are in the stage of coming up with their own publications. Two of the districts have already put out their work and the entire uh, Kerala bird atlas with the distribution of 380 species season wise, as well as little more detail on the protocol and methodology is available for free to download uh, at Bird Count India. But this is not it. Uh, the any bird atlas is not restricted to just uh, the presence, absence, uh, distribution maps. Uh, we have to use it for some scientific analysis and to make conservation, which might have conservation implications and to understand what are the factors driving the distribution of an species. So these are a couple of questions that I have been working on recently, but due to lack of time, I won't be going into uh, the depth and hopefully uh, at some other platform, I'll get a chance to uh, share my work uh, on this topics. So, thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashish. That was uh, fascinating. Obviously, the product of so many, so many person hours of work and lots of planning and execution. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty impressive and amazing. Um, I don't think there are any questions. Oh, yes, I should apologize. Uh, the video did get uh, stuck uh, a few times and then we restarted the live stream. Um, and hopefully it, after doing that, it, uh, it worked for everybody. Um, I think there are uh, mostly comments over here. There's uh, one question uh, over here. Uh, Farida asks, uh, well, she says, first, amazing amount of work. Any suggestions on how other states can start off? What will be the first uh, steps? And I guess uh, that also is about, you know, what are some of the prerequisites? What are some of the things that uh, uh, was present in Kerala or what are some of the conditions that were there in Kerala that allowed such a, such a large and ambitious project to go forward? Uh, and how do you think other states can work towards that? Ashish, uh, if you can switch okay, on the video. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So thank you, Farida. Thank you for your question. And everybody who watched the video, thanks for the appreciation. And coming back to the question, the first requirement, the first prerequisite is people, because it's citizen science. So we have to have citizen 
who can identify bird, who can you know give up their weekends, and there was no emolument or any incentive given to any of the participant who came there. So for Kerala Bird Atlas, we had around uh, more than 400 volunteers, and all other states, uh, like most of the states, are much larger in size uh, than Kerala. So the more number of people would be required. So that's a first thing and i think ncf is already working towards that you know uh, getting more and more people involved in bird watching so the day we have enough number of uh, people enthusiasts uh, we can go ahead for maybe say entire western ghats entire eastern ghats or something of that sort and not just state wise maybe we can take up a geographical area as a whole okay thanks um, uh, thanks ashish um, there's a question from Ram. I think you answered. He asks how many people joined in, in the entire effort and how many of those were not employed researchers? In other words, how many were volunteers in this? So five or six people, like out of 400 so volunteers, only five or six were probably like ecologists or researchers. Red, rest everyone, they were uh, like bankers or like like rest of the non-scientific community. They hate from non-scientific community. So, so we have been able to put out our work as a scientific publication and most of the people who were involved in it, they agreed to be a part of uh, this manuscripts and they all were given authorship. So yeah, now they all have a look at the word Atlas scientific paper under their name. Excellent. Okay. So they are, they are authors on the paper. That's wonderful. Yes. Ashish, thank you. I think we're a bit of, uh, out of time, even though we lost a bit of time, but um, we need to move ahead. There are a few more comments on uh, Slack, uh, mostly compliments. So please uh, do uh, respond to those when you have uh, time. We'll okay. move on to our next uh, talk, which is by Unikrishnan MP. Uh, Unikrishnan is a final year zoology student at Payanur College. He was introduced to citizen science through the season watch program when he was in high school. Uh, he's been involved in creating an iNaturalist community of moth earls from Kerala and he helps in identification of moths um, and other biodiversity. And he contributes observations to various citizen science platforms. Uh, Unni Krishnan will be speaking today about emerging moth earths of Kerala through citizen science. Emerging moth earths Kerala through citizen science. As we all know, to the order Lepidoptera and comprises more than 1,50,000 species globally, diversity and play a dynamic role in the ecosystem. Since majority of them are nocturnal and with inadequate reference, the study of moths becomes challenging. Citizens lead role in creating awareness on lesser known taxa like moths, creating more enthusiasts and data which are crucial for the future studies. While talking on, it's actually a citizen science project to document the Kerala, iNaturalist Kerala community and Kerala Biodiversity Monitoring Network. The community of mothers is evolving through continuous years of campaigns. The project has covered 18,000 observations with 800 plus observers. Various events, especially in connection with the National Mood Week, had a great impact in creating awareness throughout the state. As a result, the community of mothers is flourishing. Here you could see the users ranked with most number of species and the most number of species observed in the Moths of Kerala project. While looking at the statistics, number of observations is 1813, number of research grade observations 5229, number of species 984 research grade species accounts for 740 number of observers 804 analysis of weak observations from Kerala 
National Mood Week 2019 recorded 263 observations. On 2020, the observations increased rapidly to 1,365. National 2021 recorded 1,897 species from Kerala, which The main reason for the increase is COVID-19 pandemic. National Mood Week 21 Kerala. The National Mood Week event in Kerala went on through various events by observers, photographs to the Mood of Kerala project, article campaigns and many webinars. The primary aim was to involve maximum participants and sharing the knowledge on moths through various means. National 2021 Kerala ended with 1890 plus observations observers to the platform iNaturalist. Kerala recorded 22% of the National Moth Week 2021. Inevitable support from the Indian Moths Monitoring Network, Kerala Biodiversity Monitoring Network, Diversity India, iNaturalist Kerala community and organizations of the state played a crucial role in the successful completion of the event. So here are the few of these as well as article campaigns. which were organized during National Law 2021. Part of our biodiversity and play vital roles in the ecosystem. As a result, the conservation is very crucial. The evolving community of mothers will surely enable the future studies on moths ecology and conservation by creating awareness among the people and motivating them to observe, learn and record moths. Thank you. sorry <laughs> you're on mute is the the theme of the year the last two years okay so thank you anikishan that's a very fascinating uh, talk i will kick off with a question and then um, ask a few questions from the chat so my question is of the contributors to the national moth week you know what fraction do you think are people who already have been interested in moths and what fraction are those who are coming into this for the first time who did not know about moths but maybe through your publicity Uh, got to know about it. So, what's the breakup? Do you think between beginners and people who already were interested? So, actually, this Motor Scale, Motor Scale project in I N S List was started a few years back in two thousand nineteen. So, while starting the project in I N S List, so actually they were all beginners initially. There were no expert or anyone. So, citizen scientists, there are no experts. Everyone are equal. So, sharing of knowledge is. very clearly seen in through this portal so so when we look about uh, look upon this uh, inasuris project so there are no expert actually so we are all gaining knowledge through this uh, particular project so uh, but uh, about uh, 10 to 15 people are actively contributing their uh, data to this inasuris project so we have uh, uh, nearly 800 observers in this project so when we compare the data of kerala with india so about 20 percentage of the observations are for the previous national moth week had came from india so uh, many people are engaged to more thing because of the uh, national moth week event so this national moth week event had a great impact actually so kerala uh, as we as discussed earlier uh, so in the citizen science fields they are more active the people of kerala are more active uh, if we consider e bird or ines list so there are a lot of lot of contributors to the citizen science project so so that is also one of the reason and the second most reason is uh, the covid-19 pandemic so during this covid-19 pandemic so uh, uh, birding as well as uh, watching butterflies 
is not an easy task. So there are restrictions. So moving is a uh, as a we could do moving as a hobby in our homes by lighting up, uh, setting up our lights and not shutting it down. So it is one of the easiest way uh, to observe nature or one of one of the species of the nature. So. If that's that's a very reason for this much increase. So hopefully, uh, in the coming years also, we are expecting more and more contributions. So while talking about the campaigns, uh, there are many campaigns. Actually, there were a lot of webinars being done. Uh, online webinars were there, uh, and also many of the article campaigns were also there. So uh, so more and more people are engaged to the field of moting, and also. Uh, the Indian Moons Monitoring Network had also played a crucial role. Uh, so they have a network of motors. So there are a mo lot of people from Kerala too, and they are contributing their data to iNaturalist and uh, IBP also, and also Moons of India website. Right. No, obviously there's a huge amount of effort that goes into this uh, publicity and outreach and so on. Um, there's a question by Jagan. Uh, I don't know. You know, there are names of all uh, Kerala birds in Malayalam. Uh, is there any attempt to uh, uh, create Malayalam names for moths as well? So actually, uh, the creating uh, uh, the names Malayalam or the vernacular names for moths is not an easy task. The very reason is that there doesn't have even common names. So many of the species are lacking these common names. So first we need to move for common names. So if you look at a bird, we are calling the bird by a common name at first. So not its one, uh, but most, uh, the birders are actually calling them with a common name, not its scientific name. So uh, for a beginners, where attacks are which only has scientific names, it is not an easy task for them to learn about these modes. So, there were attempts. So Balakrishnan Malapil Sar had uh, given a lot of name, Malayalam names for many of the modes. So actually, the uh, by uh, actually the naming of these modes uh, is a, a, a task, a challenging task because it can uh, consist of a huge number of tags. Actually, uh, as per the data, there are more than five thousand or nearly to. Uh, uh, 10,000 species of modes here in India. So naming all those modes is also a very big task. So in near future, uh, the attempts are being done uh, to give uh, the common names. So in iNaturalist also, uh, the common names are being set for a few of the modes. So it will be increasing in the coming days. Yeah, thank you. Even even the most, uh, maybe the most common species, 10 or 20 common species, I think have names in Malayalam would be very useful to in your publicity and outreach as well. Um, uh, there's a question, I think, by Nishan. Um, is there an attempt to record the different life stages of moths uh, as well, apart from just the distributional observation? So in iNaturalist, if you're talking about iNaturalist data, there is no difference of uh, if adult or caterpillar stage, nothing like that. So all of the observations are considered to be uh, that of moon. So we could upload uh, the observations of caterpillars as well as uh, adults, as well as the pupil stage or even the eggs. So uh, while uh, looking upon the life cycles, uh, we know that Balavishnu Malapilsar has done a lot of uh, uh, life cycles and also in his, through his Facebook post and all, uh, they are reaching towards all people. So, so uh, in coming on to the INSWS project, so we could also upload the caterpillar observations too. So the observations of caterpillar will also be recorded, but the very problem is regarding the identifiers. So the identifiers are very less in INSWS as well as any of the other citizen science platforms. Since it is a very diverse taxa, we need more identifiers, more observers, as well as more identifiers who could identify this. That is also a challenging part. But through this continuous campaigns, uh, by the evolving community of motors, I think we can, uh, we can clear, uh, clearly emerge out from that particular problem. Great. Thank you, Nikrishnan. There are a couple of other uh, questions in the Slack. So if you can respond to those, that'd be very, uh, okay. very nice. Uh, but I think we'll move on now and we we'll move on to the last talk of the session, last talk of this conference, actually. The honor for that last talk goes to Vijay Barve. Uh, Vijay is a postdoctoral associate at uh, Florida Museum of Natural History. He's been involved with engaging citizens on biodiversity data collection for almost 20 years. Uh, he coordinates the Diversity India groups, which cover pretty much all of biodiversity. Uh, he specializes in biodiversity informatics, and within that, he has a special interest in citizen science. So Vijay will be talking about uh, Diversity India, 
observing India's biodiversity for 20 years. Good afternoon. My name is Vijay Barve, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Diversity India today. Over the course of this conference, we have been uh, talking a lot about different uh, citizen science projects as well as platforms for biodiversity. But Diversity India is slightly different. It is a community of people who have appreciation for biodiversity and have been together for 20 years now. Appreciating, observing, sharing, and sharing, documenting, and trying to protect the life around them has been the goal of Diversity India. So Diversity India, uh, there are volunteers who manage numerous cyber communities. We can call them as projects or groups, depending on what social media platform they are on. But basically, we utilize Google Groups, Facebook, WhatsApp, Telegram, and almost all the social media platforms. And we manage projects on them as well as also on the uh, biodiversity portals. So basically, Biodiversity India uh, is like a group of communities, uh, each focusing on one of the taxonomic groups like butterflies or moths or spiders or sometimes a thematic group like marine or intertidal life. There are also some regional groups under uh, Diversity India. So Diversity India also is a official partner with Biodiversity Atlas of India, National Moth Week, Big Butterfly Month, Dragon Festival, and so on. It is actually an unregistered entity. Uh, it does not really uh, manage any infrastructure, any portal, any uh, such thing or on its own, but it supports all the citizen science projects basically in biodiversity through different platforms and collaborations. So let me tell a little bit about the history of Diversity India. It all started in 2001 when some of my friends, we were chatting about how email is becoming available for everyone and how we can uh, kind of try and connect a few friends that we knew who uh, watch butterflies. So we thought maybe there are 15, 20 people. We can start a listserv. And at that time, there was a service called eGroups. So we started a group on eGroups. Later on, eGroups was uh, taken up by Yahoo Group, so it became Yahoo Group. And within a couple of months, the membership reached more than 100. And we started talking about butterflies and sharing photographs and uh, identities and things like that. So the group uh, continued to grow, uh, continued to communicate, continued to make bonds with each other. And in 2004, uh, we initiated what we uh, coined as uh, butterfly meets. So in these butterfly meets, basically we um, came together, uh, a group, a local group somewhere, organized these meets and invited all the people to come over and we watched butterflies and shared knowledge. Uh, by 2005, a lot of Butterfly India members uh, started realizing they also look at um, uh, several different um, groups like moths and dragonflies and spiders and things like that. So we started initiating these um, communities one by one. In 2006, we uh, organized a meet in um, Arunachal Pradesh, Jairampur, and that was like a, a big opening for us to start building a lot more collaborations and we started reaching like all corners of the of India. In 2007, again, we uh, extended with few more communities. In 2008, we had uh, Diversity India meets where we also looked at not only butterflies, but uh, a couple of meets we organized to look at herbs, to amphibians and reptiles. By 2009, within the community, there were scientific collaborations happening. So scientists approaching 
citizens to be co-authors and kind of uh, share uh, some common interest and actually uh, started publishing. In 2010, uh, Butterflies of India website was launched. It was a effort of a lot of members of original uh, Butterfly India group and uh, which which later on uh, became the Biodiversity Atlas of India. So uh, some kind of formal platform, but not directly managed by Diversity India. Uh, then in, by 2010-2011, Facebook became very popular and Facebook community started uh, growing and uh, as Diversity India, we also created several Facebook communities and we, we uh, still kept in touch. People were using less email and more Facebook, so we kind of adapted to that. By 2012 or 2013, people started realizing the members that uh, portals like iNaturalist and India Biodiversity Portal are the way to go. So and that's where we can actually accumulate and collect our data uh, properly. So slowly members started using that. We also formally started um, participating in the National Moth Week, which is a big mothing event all over the world. Um, in 2014, we initiated the Dragonfly Meet, which continues till date. We have uh, Dragonfly Meets and sometimes concurrent uh, seminars or workshops happening about dragonflies. Similar kinds of meets for um, spiders were initiated in 2016, which are also happening every year since then. Um, as time changed, uh, more uh, uh, smartphone-based uh, uh, smartphone apps like uh, WhatsApp and Telegram started becoming popular and commonly used. So we also started initiating uh, communities um, but mostly by the same name on WhatsApp and Telegram too. In 2019, uh, because of uh, more international membership of Dragonfly India, we decided to rename it as Dragonfly South Asia because we had uh, several active members from Sri Lanka and other adjoining countries. So uh, we basically went from India to South Asia in some sense. Since 2012, uh, again, we Mm, help organize a big butterfly month, which is one of the largest biodiversity events in India. Uh, there was a book on spiders, Spider Genera of India was published by some of the Spider India members coming together. So it was an excellent citizen science project where uh, scientists and citizens uh, coming together to actually publish a complete book. And then uh, we also uh, started celebrating Spider Week from last year and then this year we continued all these activities like big butterfly month national moth week spider week and also officially partnering with dragonfly festival so this has been the journey over last 20 years so the philosophy of uh, diversity india is basically uh, what we can say in four words observation education research and conservation so most of the citizen scientists start as uh, curious observers and started looking at uh, bio biodiversity around them, start with ID please kind of questions on Facebook and WhatsApp. And slowly they slightly get educated. They start learning about biodiversity. They say, rather than asking ID please, they say, is this this, is it this? So they have that kind of knowledge and they also start learning about the platforms like India Biodiversity Portal and uh, biodiversity Atlas of India and I naturally, so they become a little more educated and uh, start contributing. Uh, slowly, uh, some of them, they move to uh, what we call as research phase, where there is more regular documentation of certain regions or uh, looking at how to different between these taxa and that taxa. They accumulate hundreds of records and they actually are invited to be co-authors on research papers. And all these definitely leads to conservation because these are the people who also share these things with the policy maker. And we uh, basically say, oh, we need to protect this. And this is how you do so. Basically, these people start engaging into con conservation. So we have already uh, discussed a lot about what are the different roles of citizen science. So can all, all these people be called citizen science. 
to my mind uh, there are three levels there are curious enthusiasts there are uh, citizen volunteers and then citizen scientists who actually publish or do research so the so the goal of uh, diversity india has been basically to increase this um uh, percentage or number of citizen volunteers and citizen scientists from uh, merely the curious biodiversity enthusiasts so that's the main uh, goal with which uh, we are we all are diversity and they are working so uh, that is basically uh, what i wanted to say diversity india is always open for partnerships and collaborations and you can uh, contact us for that on either twitter or email or uh, through our website and we are happy happy to talk more about these collaborations thank you great thank you uh, so much vijay and uh, it's a remarkable work by you and of course many many other people um it's a good uh, uh, chance to remind uh, everybody listening that uh, we are in the middle of big uh, uh, butterfly month uh, literally in the middle it's all of september so please do participate in that there are many many events happening across the country and the world um several uh, questions uh, vijay some more complex some uh, simpler i'll try and ask the slightly more complex questions and then the simpler ones perhaps you can answer in the chat um shannon says that um, uh, you know it's a challenge to get people interested in things that aren't i'm paraphrasing things that aren't birds or mammals um and especially invertebrates i guess so um what are some of the ways do you think are effective in um, getting people interested in those uh, unloved creatures that deserve much more love i i think uh, for us it uh, fortunately uh, it started with butterflies because it it all initiated when i was talking to some of my friends like krishna meg and arvind madhyastha and subhadra devi so all these people were keen butterfly watchers and it started with that and butterflies uh, in the insect world are in some sense more uh, appreciable or um, not many people scared of them there are a few people who are scared of them which i was really surprised to see but in general i would say uh, not many people are scared and then when we started looking at butterflies and like organically this community grew people were saying oh, okay we also look at moths we also look at spiders we also look at beetles or things like that and then you said okay we do not have a lot of um, expertise for that but let's let's see let's start building a community and as with many most of the communities it, it typically started with 10 or 15 people and then slowly it kept on growing so that is the that is how it has grown and and now there are a lot of people who are more interested in things like lesser known insects than uh, the the big birds and butterflies and mammals kind of thing so yeah yeah that's how Now, i think we have approached so uh, have you made any effort to reach out to the larger public i mean i think part of the question is also are there articles you know in the popular press uh, uh, mm -hmm. mass media things like that uh, yes so so uh, members have been uh, regularly uh, publishing i mean it's not uh, really under the it may not be under the banner of diversity india but definitely coming together discussing and learning from each other uh, helps in building uh, knowledge a lot of interesting news and a lot of interesting resources are shared on these communities so anyone who is really keen in uh, that kind of uh, mass media uh, communication gets a lot of resources and there are also at times requests on the on on the community is saying oh i want to write a article do you have any suggestions or uh, can you um, share some good pictures or people specifically asking oh you had that really interesting uh, thing captured can you share that photo for this article things like that so i think that that is how it has helped there's a lot of interest in the various uh, communication platforms that you mentioned you know from mm -hmm. email groups and then facebook whatsapp telegram um and uh, again just to paraphrase a couple of uh, questions there you know is there uh, is there a sort of a conscious strategy uh, for these co different communication platforms um 
uh, about how to use them uh, and what kind content goes where you know what content is mm-hmm. more suitable for which part is a conscious strategy or is it something that just sort of you played by your you figure it out as you go along uh, yes i think mostly that is how it has been so we have been as a community we have been discussing um what are like uh, pitfalls or what how we need to proceed things like that like something really really basic is a lot of people initially just post a photograph and write id please and nothing more so every every such post initially one of the group members one of the co- uh, members will ask okay please tell us where and when it was seen at least that will be helpful for one thing is identification and for us to understand seasonality or things like that so it starts from there and then different platforms have their own kind of advantages and disadvantages like most of these platforms they have a very short uh, uh, memory i say like within within a day or two uh, it it becomes difficult for a facebook post to really go and look at it or similar things for whatsapp so uh, slowly started transitioning uh, all the all the occurrence records to more uh, uh, biodiversity portals like india biodiversity portal and nature list and biodiversity atlas of india so yeah it it it, it is evolving and it it is still growing we are still figuring out things and how we yeah that's that's great for how, a, yeah, yeah sorry sorry go ahead no so i'm saying it it's uh, it's still open for discussion man we keep changing the policies once in a while nothing is rigid <laughs> yeah um i think it's remarkable for a set of volunteers you know purely in their spare time to have uh, accomplished so much is is just amazing we're out of time uh, vijay but there is one question which i think uh, is crying out to be answered uh, lakshmikant asks what is the status of the national butterfly uh there was a poll i think some time ago uh, right. is the process so, complete or not is what he asks right so it, it is uh, it is being followed up but you know uh, government processes take time uh, i was told that we are pretty close and then the minister changed so things like that happen and then but, it is but, going to take a little time through government process but we are definitely following it up but do, do we know what that species is going to be or is that not yet public uh that i think it's government's uh, uh, thing to announce we don't want to <laughs> preempt anything <laughs> understood all right well thank you to all three of you ashish shunikrishnan and vijay thank you so much for a wonderful session so that brings us to a close of this uh, afternoon's uh, set of talks uh, we move on now to the closing session of this conference so um, uh, let's see i'm hoping that most of our Uh, organizing committee members are here with us on zoom um one to a couple of uh, them are here uh but without uh, further ado let's just go ahead <clears throat> uh you know towards uh, get into the the final part which is um, just to wrap things up and um uh the first thing to say is uh, that this wrap up i'm doing on behalf of the entire conference organizing committee and that is farida tampal uh, pankaj shekhsaria r prabhakar shannon olson and myself sohil khader um and i think that the first people to thank let's say the first person to thank is our conference coordinator uh, akshata pradhan uh, and if this had been a hall full of people i am sure she would get a standing ovation akshata has worked tirelessly for pretty much 24 hours i think without any sleep for the last a uh, week and and something like that for the last two months so we owe all of us uh, akshata a great uh, debt if you enjoyed this conference please do uh, make sure you drop her a line on slack in the lounge somewhere or the other to express your appreciation um we also have two people who've been helping at the back end on the technology side of things amit and tamiran uh they are also both on slack and also please feel free to thank them uh they have ensured that we have been able to make this connection between slack and zoom and youtube uh workable there have been hiccups here and there you know we can't do anything about bandwidth and so on but uh, i think by and large it's gone well and it's gone relatively smoothly and if there have been hiccups we've been able to recover from them and continue the the conversations on slack and so on uh there's a technical problem at my end with the noise i'm afraid i can't do anything about that i'm so sorry uh, about it 
Um, also, great thanks to the volunteers who helped us uh, moderate uh, on Slack on Slack side of things. Uh, so those include uh, Arpita uh, Batter, uh, Bhattacharji, Rito Gorto, Chanda, Kaushik Sarkar, Tarun Menon, and Mittal Gala. We had a few session moderators who are not from the organizing committee, Preeti Bangal, Ashin Vishwanathan, and Kaveri Karkutta. Thank you to uh, all of you. Um, you heard uh, uh, over these four days from two of these working groups that were put together to discuss various uh, two important aspects of citizen science. So our thanks to the members of those working groups, uh, one on citizen science data, that's Bala Subramanian, Subramanian Dandapani, uh, Thomas uh, Vattakavin, uh, Priya Singh, Sudhena Jagannathan, Geeta Ramaswamy, and Vijay Barve, and the working group on diversity and inclusion, uh, which comprised Kaveri, Kaveri Kargupta, P. Jagannathan, Naveen Nambudri, Sneha Dharwadkar, and Prashant Enes. Uh, the, just to remind you that those documents, uh, the working documents that they have put together are up on the website. Uh, there's a, a link called working groups on the main menu and you can look at those documents uh, and please do uh, comment on them. I'll, I'll say a little bit about commenting on those documents later. Um, overarching support for this uh, conference and last year's conference came from the uh, principal scientific advisor to the government of India. Uh, the National Biodiversity Authority and the Biodiversity Collaborative. Uh, the conference partners were ATRI, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment, uh, CTARA, which is a center for technology alternatives for rural areas, uh, the ECHO Network from MetaStream Foundation, from the National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, from the Nature Conservation Foundation, and from WWF India. So some reminders, uh, please. Uh, there's a poll for the logo. Uh, of the conference. Um, I think some 40 people have voted in that poll. It's in the lounge uh, channel. Uh, please do vote if you haven't yet. Uh, that will be important to decide what logo gets to represent this uh, website and conference in the future and this community actually. Um, we do need feedback from all of you. As mentioned several times during the conference, uh, the only way in which uh, uh, organizers can plan a better conference next year that takes into account hitches, uh, improve suggestions for improvements and all that is for you to provide that feedback. And it's much better you provide the feedback in that form because it has a structure rather than um, free text feedback in the in Slack itself, which is much harder to go through and, and compile. So please do fill out the form. Also feel free to add your thoughts in Slack. Um, and um, the directory of citizen science projects, as you know, is up on the website. If you uh, manage or run a citizen science project, please do add your uh, your project to that directory. Uh, the link for that is in the announcements channel, uh, just like the link for the feedback. Um, so for the logo and for the feedback uh, for the conference, and also for comments on the uh, draft papers from the working groups, if you could please send in uh, those by the 20th of uh, September, that would be uh, wonderful. Um, so the logo poll will close then. Uh, that's done in Slack itself. The feedback form is a Google form. Again, we'll close that on the 20th of September. Uh, the comments on the uh, working group documents can be sent by email, and the email address is on the website. Um, and of course, the Director of Citizen Science Projects, as in when you are able to, please upload your project there. That's not going to end. There's going to be no deadline for that. But we'd like to have that directly be as comprehensive uh, as possible. A report of the conference will, conference will be uploaded to the website, uh, just like last year's report. Uh, you can go to uh, previous events and you can see last year's conference summary as well as the entire report. So similarly, we'll do a report for this year. Uh, the Slack workspace for this conference will remain open until the 26th of September. Uh, so that's another 10 days. And then, um, and then we'll close the Slack workspace, uh, but videos of the talks and the open house sessions will still remain available into the future on the website. Uh, and there's a link on the website where you can view those and you please share those with your friends as well. Um, and we hope uh, to have another conference again around this time last year. Uh, and uh, right away, if people would like to uh, volunteer to help with the organizing the conference, with publicizing it, with uh, doing various kinds of planning for the conference, please let us know by email or on Slack, uh, and that would be very welcome. So um, before we completely close, if there's any um, uh, last thoughts from any of the other uh, 
organizing committee members or Akshata, anybody else here on Zoom with me, uh, please do unmute and, uh, and speak. I just want to say thank you to everyone, all the, obviously all the people that, that Sahil thanked, we couldn't do without you. I especially want to thank the participants. Um, this is my favorite conference for that reason. I love your interactions. I love that you keep this going. I think we do need to think of ways, uh, as was suggested by Sahil earlier today, to keep this going all year long and make this uh, a community that that stands. So that's what we're working towards. And I think with the enthusiasm of this, this group that we're part of, I, I think we can do it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. Prabhakar, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that uh, it is very, very important to build a community and from last year to this year, I, we can see a community being built. I think this community must be fostered, must be kind of maintained. There must be continuity in the community. And over time, I think uh, we are just at the tip of the iceberg in a country like India, which is densely populated with people in every corner of the country. So citizen science in biodiversity will grow. It has huge potential and it also has a huge benefit for conservation. So please sustain this community. It's about up to all of us to sustain this community and make it grow. The second thing is it's been a great uh, fun and learning for me to work with uh, the other OC members, as well as looking at all the papers that were submitted, all the contributed papers, working towards this particular uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's build a nice community. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhakar. Would anybody else like to say something? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. first of all, I would like to thank all of our organizing committee members for including me uh, in this for the last two years. And uh, Akshita, Amit, Tamir, and all of our wonderful participants. Uh, what I would like to see is, you know, this is an annual conference. We are meeting once a year, and I'm hopeful that, you know, we may have a hybrid mode next year. At least some of us meet. But maybe we should have many more smaller such uh, initiatives uh, statewide. People can initiate. There are many. Already there are. Uh, there is a huge uh, 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 momentum which is there in different states. And maybe you know we can have many smaller ones like this throughout the year, so that when we come together annually, we have much more to share. So I, I am looking forward for those kind of uh, meetups uh, uh, statewide or you know region wise or zone wise. So I am really looking forward to interact, and we'll be happy. To support in that. Thank you, Farida. Thank in, you, in fact, yes, uh, if uh, all of you, of course, are uh, experts at mobilizing people and getting communities together in, in your areas, but if there's anything that we can do, uh, Citizen Science India as a whole can do to help in state level or district level or whatever level uh, events, please let us know. We'd be happy to help in any way we can. Uh, Akshata, is there any way you can um, show your video? I would like to end by uh, you know, everybody being able to see you, if that's possible. Uh, and uh, there we are. Uh, and applaud. I'm going to applaud over here. Thank you so much uh, for everything. If you want to say a few words, you can, but it's not necessary. Um, I just want to thank everybody. It might seem like, uh, you know, my name is everywhere because I'm the first point of contact, contacting all of you by email, telephone, and constant nudges. But that's not the case at all. The organizing team has been there. The entire idea and everything comes from them. And um, yeah, and without Amit and Tamzan, this would not have been possible. Amit has been my uh, support uh, constantly um, and everything is running smooth because of the both of them. And also a big thank you to all our uh, participants who've been contributing and, in, uh, and you continue to inspire us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. See you all next year. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, firstly, Akshita is actually the anchor, <laughs> much less credit to all of us. Yeah. But I agree yeah. with the last point, which is that uh, it's greatly inspiring to see all of you and all the wonderful work that you do in citizen science uh, out there. Um, so let's close now. Let's keep the conversation going on Slack. Let's type away, uh, take a break and come back later in the afternoon and, and continue to interact and, and type. Uh, as I said, the workspace will be open for 10 days. Let's make uh, the most of that opportunity uh, and continue to uh, communicate with each other. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much and see you next year. Bye, everyone. Thank you.